Dear students, hello and assalamu alaikum. I am Ali Abbas Kazalbash, and today's program will be on the study of hereditary materials known as nucleic acids and on the process of protein synthesis. Now, nucleic acids are the essential components of life. They are found in the chromosomes in the nucleus of all living cells, and they code for all the functions that are carried out by each living cell and organism. Nucleic acids are then passed on from one generation to the next through the process of replication and reproduction. It is in these nucleic acids that determine the morphological and physiological characteristics of an individual. It's the sequence of nucleotides on the nucleic acids that code for amino acids that make the specific molecules of protein in order to perform the desired functions. Now, with the dawn of the new millennium, scientists have now mapped the human genome, which is actually the code of nucleotides held within the nucleic acids. In order to better understand the process of hereditary diseases and to ascertain a cure for these ailments. This further amplifies the importance of nucleic acids and the process of protein synthesis, which is directly linked to the sequence of nucleotides found on the nucleic acid. Today's program is dedicated to the structure of nucleic acids and the process of protein synthesis. Now, basically, there are two main types of nucleic acids, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. Now, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA as it's more commonly known, is a complex molecule composed of several repeating units called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is then further composed of three subunits, a cyclic five-carbon sugar called deoxyribose, phosphoric acid molecule, and any of the four nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Adenine and guanine are larger nitrogen bases and are called purines, while cytosine and thymines are smaller and are known as pyrimidines. Now, as there are four kinds of nitrogen bases, there are also four types of nucleotides. Each nucleotide is named upon its base. So we have an adenine nucleotide, a guanine nucleotide, a cytosine nucleotide, and a thymine nucleotide. These nucleotides are linked to form a polynucleotide chain. In this linkage, the sugar of one nucleotide is bound to the phosphate group of another nucleotide, and so on. In every nucleotide, the phosphate group is attached to the fifth carbon of the sugar, and during the process of linkage, the phosphate group of one nucleotide is linked to the third carbon of another nucleotide. Now, after the chemical analysis of DNA, attempts were made to know as to how these components are arranged on the DNA molecule. Now, the first attempts were made by Wilkins and Franklin. They used x-rays for obtaining the three-dimensional picture of a DNA molecule. They found out that DNA is a helical structure and that there are at least two helices coiled around each other. Then in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick presented the model of DNA molecule by utilizing all the available information about DNA at the present time. The salient features of the Watson and Crick model are, each DNA molecule is made up of two chains or strands, which are coiled together in a twisted form looking like a coil ladder. Now the upright portion of this, of this model consists of the sugar, and phosphate nucleotides, whereas the rungs are made up of the nitrogen-based nucleotides. Each rung consists of a purine linked with a pyrimidine. That means adenine will be linked with thymine and guanine with cytosine. Now, both the nucleotide chains are attached in an opposite direction as visible in this model. In other words, a three prime end and a five prime end. Now, both the chains are held by weak hydrogen bonds, which you can see over here. Between guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds, 
whereas between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds. The amount of adenine in one strand is equal to that of thymine on the other, and the same is the case for guanine and cytosine. Now, dear students, the Watson and Crick model of DNA did not only explain its chemical structure, but also the mechanism by which it duplicates itself. When the synthesis of DNA starts, both the strands are separated due to the breakage of the hydrogen bonds. Then, one strand is cut and resealed after releasing the tension of the DNA molecule. The separation of both the strands and the release of tension is done by helix destabilizing proteins and enzymes called topoisomerases. Now, both strands, after detachment, act as a template for the synthesis of new strands. The new strands are synthesized by enzyme DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase, taking the original strand as a template, adds complementary nucleotides to synthesize the new strand. In other words, if the old strand has TGG as its nucleotide sequence, then the DNA polymerase will add ACC to the new strand or complementary strand. In this way, two daughter molecules of DNA are produced from one DNA molecule. In each daughter DNA molecule, one strand is the original and the other is the newly formed strand. This means that the DNA replication is said to be semi-conservative. The enzyme DNA polymerase adds nucleotides in only the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. As the DNA molecule has two antiparallel strands, thus the enzyme carries on continuous replication from the 3' prime to 5' prime end. But on the other strand, in other words, the 5' prime to 3' prime strand, the replication is discontinuous. Here it occurs in the form of small fragments, and these fragments are later on joined together by the enzyme DNA ligase. The replication of DNA starts from certain special sites called replication insertion sites, RIS. And on a long DNA molecule, there may be several RISs. Dear students, now before going into the process of protein synthesis, we must first be familiar with the genetic code. Actually, a particular gene controls the synthesis of polypeptide chains, and the gene is nothing more than the sequence of nucleotides or bases along the length of the DNA molecule. There are only four types of bases, but 20 kinds of amino acids. Now, if one base codes for one amino acid, then 16 amino acids remain without codes. If two bases code for one amino acid, then there will be 16 codes, and again, four amino acids have no codes. If three bases code for one amino acid, then the codes are sufficient for 20 amino acids. This is the reason why the genetic code is called the triplet code. Now, the genetic code is universal, except in the case for the mitochondrial code. In other words, in all living organisms, one code, for example, UCA, spells a specific amino acid, and that's serine. Now, this code system is having no commas or full stops. Therefore, the insertion or deletion of any base changes the whole sequence of amino acids and onwards. The examples of codes shown here indicate that the third base is not so important in some codes and in some the second one. However, in most of the codes, change in the first base changes the code and hence the amino acid and protein as well. The change of one single amino acid may cause the failure of protein function. For example, in sickle cell anemia, glutamate 
is replaced by valine, which results in sickle cell anemia. The cell organelles responsible for protein synthesis are basically three types of ribonucleic acids, RNAs. These RNAs have the same composition as does DNA, except in the case of RNA, there's a ribose sugar instead of the deoxyribose sugar in DNA, and the uracil nitrogen base instead of the thymine nitrogen base. Now, there are three types of RNA molecules. Ribosomal RNA, rRNA, messenger RNA, mRNA, and transfer RNA, tRNA. The ribosomal RNAs combines with the proteins to form a granular structure called ribosome. These ribosomes are present in the cytoplasm as well as being attached on the rough endoplasmic reticulum in the cell cytoplasm. Now the ribosomes exist basically in two subunits. The smaller is 40S and the larger of 60S. Upon combining, both these subunits give rise to a complete ribosomal particle of 80S instead of 100S. This is due to the fact that when biochemical reactions occur between two molecules, certain things are released to make the bondage. The unit S stands for the scientist Stredberg, specifying the sedimentation rate of a specific particle or molecule in the medium during ultracentrifugation. Now the large subunit of a ribosome has basically two sites. The aminoacyl site, designated as A, and the peptidyl site, designated as capital P. The P site has an enzyme peptide synthetase on it. Now, the messenger RNA, the mRNA molecule, is produced inside the nucleus by an enzyme RNA polymerase. Both strands of the DNA molecule open up, and the RNA polymerase copies the coding strand sequence of nucleotides. The RNA polymerase reads a specific DNA sequence and adds the complementary nucleotides to produce the messenger RNA. For instance, if the sequence of nucleotides in a coding strand of DNA is, let's say, T-A-C-G-G-A-T-T, -T, as given here, then the complementary nucleotides on the messenger RNA will be A-U-G-C-C-C-U-A-A. -C -C in all cases of RNAs, the uracil U is incorporated instead of thymine, the T part of the nitrogen basis. The primary messenger RNA is immature and long. It does not enter the cytoplasm in this form. Only after the extra segments are removed, the mature form of the messenger RNA is produced, which then leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm. Now, the messenger RNA has one ribosomal binding sites that contains the AUG triplet codon, which is called the starting or initiation codon. Secondly, it contains amino acids coding codons. And thirdly, it contains a termination codon, UAA, present at the end of the messenger RNA. Mostly, the messenger RNAs have a length of about 900 to 9,000 nucleotides, coding for 300 to 3,000 amino acids. Now, transfer RNA basically acts as the laborer. It picks up the amino acid and carries it to the ribosome that is attached with the messenger RNA. For each kind of amino acid, therefore, there is a particular type of transfer RNA or tRNA. So there are at least 20 tRNAs present in the cytoplasm, each one for a particular amino acid. 
Now on the tRNA, there are four sites. An anticodon site, which is matched with the codon of the messenger RNA, the ribosomal binding site, the enzyme recognition site for the enzyme that activates the amino acid before binding with the transfer RNA, and the amino acid binding site. Now, amino acids are the raw materials for protein synthesis and are large organic molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. They are, as I said previously, a total of 20 amino acids found in nature. And plants synthesize this amino acid, and animals have to depend upon the plants for obtaining the amino acids in the form of plant proteins. Now, all amino acids are similar in having a hydrogen atom, an amino group, and a carboxyl group. But they differ in their reactant, or R groups. Now, all of these four groups are attached to the same carbon, which is called the alpha carbon. The amino acids are linked with each other by a peptide bond. The peptide bond is formed by an enzyme called peptide synthetase, present on the large ribosomal subunit. Now, for each peptide bond, one molecule of water is released. But during protein digestion, the enzyme utilizes that one molecule of water to break the peptide bond. So this is basically a reversible reaction. Now, assemblage of amino acids into proteins or the process of protein synthesis is referred to as the process of translation. The organelles responsible for the synthesis of proteins are produced within the nucleus. Then these come out into the cytoplasm through small nuclear pores present in the nuclear membrane. The message on the messenger RNA is in the language of codes. This code language is translated into a polypeptide chain by ribosomes. A sequence of these nucleotides, the length of the DNA or messenger RNA, is then called the genetic code. And it represents a single amino acid. Now, any change in the sequence of nucleotides changes the code and hence the amino acid at the protein level. And the process of protein synthesis is completed in three steps. The chain initiation, chain elongation, and chain termination. Now firstly, a special transfer RNA, tRNA, is loaded with the methionine amino acid, the initiation codon. This then binds with a small ribosomal subunit, the 40S unit. This complex binds with the messenger RNA in the ribosomal binding site. After this, the large ribosomal subunit, the 60S, binds with it. Later on, the first methionine amino acid is removed from the polypeptide chain. Now, the chain elongation starts soon after the binding of the large ribosomal subunit with the messenger RNA. A tRNA loaded with an amino acid comes to the ribosome. It binds with the aminoacyl site and matches its anticodon with that of the messenger RNA. If both the codon and the anticodon are complementary, in other words, they match, then the amino acid is handed over to the ribosome. Simultaneously, upon matching the codon, the ribosome moves to the next codon on the messenger RNA. Due to this movement, the first transfer RNA attached with the P site is released. Now the P site is occupied by the second transfer RNA and site A, the aminoacyl site, is left vacant to accept another loaded tRNA. Again, a new loaded tRNA comes and attaches itself with the aminoacyl site, matches its anticodon, and hands over the amino acid to the ribosome. In this way, a long chain of amino acids is synthesized. The 
peptide synthetase forms the peptide bond between the amino group of the first and the carboxylic group of the second amino acid. Thus, the direction of protein synthesis is from the NH2 part to the C00H part, the amino part to the carboxylic part. Protein synthesis is a very fast process, this must be noted, and that approximately 150 amino acids are incorporated in about one minute. At the end of the messenger RNA, there is the termination codon, UAA. This codon does not code for any amino acid. Now, when the ribosome reaches this codon, both the subunits split up and the polypeptide chain is released. Now, in some cases, as the ribosome moves forward on the messenger RNA, another ribosome comes and attaches with the same messenger RNA. This process is repeated several times, and as a result, you have many ribosomes attached to the same messenger RNA. This structure is called a polysome, or polyribosome. And the advantage of a polysome, or polyribosome, is that it provides many copies of the same protein molecule simultaneously. To summarize the process of protein synthesis, let's look at the schematic provided. Now, the process is initiated in the nucleus, where the DNA uncoils at a specific site, and the desired genetic code is transcribed onto a messenger RNA. Then the unwanted segments of the immature RNA are then cleaved, leaving a mature messenger RNA. Then this mature messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm. At the same time, ribosomal RNA subunits and transfer RNAs are produced within the nucleus and leave the nucleus via the nuclear pores to enter the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, there is a convergence of the RNAs within the ribosomal unit. Now here, the messenger RNA is read and translated into various amino acids, which then eventually produce a protein molecules after binding with each other, forming the polypeptide chains. Now these protein molecules are either utilized within the cell or released to produce the desired effect. With this, dear students, we've come to the end of our program. I would like to thank you for your attention. Until we meet again, wish you the very best. Allah Hafiz.
Hello and assalamu alaikum. I am Ali Abbas Kazalbash and I would like to welcome you back to our series of programs on biology. Today's topic of discussion, my dear students, is a very common yet complex process which occurs within every living cell, the process of respiration. Now, dear students, you all know that all living cells respire. Respiration refers to a series of complex oxidation reduction reactions, whereby living cells obtain energy through the breakdown of organic substances. Now you can see from the overall reaction of respiration that glucose is oxidized to six molecules of carbon dioxide, whereas six molecules of oxygen are reduced to six molecules of water. As a result, energy is obtained and released in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now the energy that is obtained by the breakdown of glucose is used for different activities within your body. Now from this reaction you may also recall our discussion on photosynthesis and realize that in fact the reaction is the exact opposite of that of respiration. Where re energy in photosynthesis is used to make sugar and oxygen, but here in respiration sugar is broken down producing energy and carbon dioxide. The process of respiration may be better understood by analyzing the behavior of a long distant runner who breathes deeply and rhythmically as his legs keep up the steady beat along the track. Internally, his body responds smoothly to match the pace of the move motions. Oxygen flowing into his lungs enters the blood, passes through many blood vessels until it is delivered to the cells of his tissue, and in this case, it's his muscles. The muscles are ready to receive the oxygen and contain an abundance of mitochondria, the site of cellular aerobic respiration, which starts producing ATP as soon as oxygen has appeared. The mitochondria are fueled by glucose present in the cytoplasm in the form of glycogen. Respiration, however, is not as simple as that and involves numerous chemical reactions and steps controlled by various enzymes, all of which are present in the mitochondria, the site of respiration in eukaryotic cells. Now, dear students, since the entire process of respiration takes place inside the cells, it is known as cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, which includes all the various metabolic pathways by which carbohydrates and other metabolites are broken down with the release of energy and in the form of ATP. Now aerobic cellular respiration refers to those pathways that require oxygen as indicated by the word aerobic and result in a complete breakdown of metabolites to carbon dioxide and water. This figure here shows an overall equation of aerobic cellular respiration, a process that usually begins with glucose. The overall equation for aerobic cellular respiration is the coupling of glucose breakdown to ATP buildup. Now during respiration, the breakdown of one glucose molecule results in the production of 38 ATP molecules. The process itself utilizes two ATP molecules, therefore the net gain of respiration is 36 ATP molecules. Now my dear students, you should know that aerobic cellular respiration does not occur all at once. Instead, glucose is broken down in four phases. Glycolysis, transition reaction, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport system. Now let us discuss each step in detail. Glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate. Now oxidation, which is the removal of hydrogen atoms, provides enough energy for the immediate buildup of two ATP molecules. Glycolysis takes place 
outside the mitochondria and does not utilize oxygen. The other stages of aerobic cellular respiration take place inside the mitochondria where oxygen is utilized. Dear students, you can see here in this figure that as glycolysis begins, two ATP molecules are used to activate glucose, a six carbon molecule that splits into two three carbon molecules, each of which is phosphorylated. From this point on, each three carbon molecule undergoes a, the same series of reactions and you can call these steps as energy investment steps as two ATP molecules have been used up. If we go further, we can see that the oxidation of metabolites results in the production of two NADH molecules and the energy is released to allow for the formation of four ATP molecules. As discussed earlier, glucose, the six carbon molecule, is unstable and readily splits into two three carbon molecules, that is phosphoglyceraldehyde, PGAL. Each PGAL molecule then picks up an inorganic phosphate group from the surrounding cytoplasm to become diphosphoglyceric acid, which is oxidized to yield hydrogen, which is then picked up by the molecule of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD. The NAD, which is an oxidized molecule, then becomes reduced to NADH2, and it is one of the main hydrogen carriers in cellular respiration. The two molecules of the three carbon compound PGA then enter the several chemical reactions during which phosphate groups are transferred to four ADP molecules, regenerating four ATP molecules. I hope that you remember that since two ATP molecules were required to start the initial activation of glucose molecules, and now four have been produced, therefore the net gain of glycolysis is two ATP molecules. And the last step of glycolysis yields these two molecules of pyruvic acid, or pyruvate. The second phase is the transition reaction phase. Now during this phase, pyruvate, produced in glycolysis, is oxidized to an acetyl group, and carbon dioxide is removed. Since glycolysis ends with two molecules of pyruvate, the transition reaction occurs twice, once per glucose molecule. Now, as you have just learned that the transition reaction releases carbon dioxide, it is called so because of the fact that it connects glycolysis to the third phase, the Krebs cycle. Now, in the transition reaction, the conversion to two three-carbon acetyl groups is uh, coupled with the attachment to a coenzyme A and carbon dioxide is given off. This is an oxidation reaction in which the electrons are removed from the pyruvate by an enzyme that uses NAD as the coenzyme. And NAD plus becomes NADH2 as acetyl coenzyme A is formed. In this figure, you can see that the different places of the cell where the phases of cellular aerobic respiration takes place. One, glycolysis, takes place in the cytoplasm. Then the second part, which is the transition reaction, and the third, the Krebs cycle, take place in the matrix of the mitochondria. Whereas the fourth stage, the electron transport system, takes place within the Christi of the mitochondria. The third phase of the glucose breakdown is known as Krebs cycle. Now the Krebs cycle is a cyclic metabolic pathway located in the matrix of the mitochondria. The Krebs cycle is so named after the British scientist Sir Hans Krebs. Now the Krebs cycle begins with the molecule of citrate. 
For this reason, it is also known as the citric acid cycle. Now, during the Krebs cycle, eventually, the high-energy pyruvate molecule is broken down completely to simple end products, carbon dioxide and water, having released most of its energy along the way. During the Krebs cycle, in the presence of oxygen, the three-carbon pyruvic acid, or pyruvate molecule, oxidizes with NAD molecules, accepting two hydrogen atoms and losing one carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. As already mentioned, it is actually the acetyl-CoA that enters the Krebs cycle. The acetyl group separates from the coenzyme A to combine with the four-carbon molecule called oxaloacetate. The result is a six-carbon compound, of course, known as citric acid or citrate. The citric acid undergoes a series of cyclic changes, beginning with the conversion to ketoglutarate, then to succinate fumarate, and finally to oxaloacetate. The cycle will co continue as long as acetyl-CoA is available. The last phase of cellular aerobic respiration is the electron transport system. The electron transport system, located in the Christi of the mitochondria, is a series of carriers that pass electrons from one to the other. Some of the protein carriers of the system are cytochrome molecules. Therefore, the system is also termed as the cytochrome system. Here again, similarities with the electron transport system of photosynthesis can be drawn. In the respiration electron transport system, the electrons that are released are carried by NAD and FAD molecules, as you can see in this figure. When the NADH plus molecule is the next molecule which receives the electrons, it is reduced. In short, we can say that during the cytochrome system, the electrons that have been accepted by the NAD and FAD molecules are now passed along a series of electron carriers like cytochrome B, cytochrome C, cytochrome A, etc. These cytochromes are alternatively reduced as they receive electrons and oxidized when they give up the electrons with the gain or loss of energy. Now here again, each acceptor is at a lower energy level than its predecessing one, and therefore energy is released during this process and formed in, in the ATP molecule. At the end of the chain, the electrons are accepted by oxygen, which combines with the two hydrogen ions to produce the water molecule. So we can conclude that at the end of the series of reactions during aerobic respiration, glucose molecule is completely broken down in four phases into carbon dioxide, water, and energy is released in the form of ATP. Dear students, we have just discussed aerobic cellular respiration, where oxygen is used to oxidize or completely break down a glucose molecule to release energy, carbon dioxide and water are produced as byproducts. Now we will discuss anaerobic cellular respiration or fermentation. So far, dear students, we have learned that the result of glycolysis are two molecules of pyruvate which are formed. Now the process of fermentation which is the breakdown of sugars in the absence of oxygen, consists of glycolysis plus one other reaction, the reduction of pyruvate to either lactate or lactic acid or alcohol. And the end product of carbon dioxide is the uh, byproduct of this reaction as shown in this figure. Now certain anaerobic bacteria such as lactobacillus help in the manufacture of cheese, 
consistently produce lactate or lactic acid in this manner. Other bacteria anaerobically produce chemicals of industrial importance like isopropanol, butyric acid, propionic acid, acetic acid, which is also known as vinegar. Yeasts are a good example of organisms that generate alcohol and carbon dioxide during the breakdown of carbohydrates through the process of fermentation. Yeasts are also used in bread making, where they ferment flour in the form of dough and produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. The alcohol vaporizes in the high temperature and the carbon dioxide helps to raise the dough to form loaves of bread. Anaerobic respiration also occurs in the muscles of living things. During fast and often extensive exercising. This is because that even though the amount of energy produced through anaerobic respiration is less than that produced by aerobic respiration, the process is often quicker. Therefore, when your body needs energy very quickly, then as a result, especially when you're exercising rigorously, the muscles in your body start respiring anaerobically. This results in the buildup of lactic acid in your muscles, which causes cramps to occur. This is why some athletes who have not trained properly suffer from cramps halfway through their routine. Now, after the rigorous exercise, you sometimes find yourself breathing very heavily for a long time. This is because your body needs the excess oxygen to break down the lactic acid buildup in your muscles through the process of aerobic respiration. Dear students, so far we have been discussing cellular respiration. Now we will discuss the process of gaseous exchange, the actual process of breathing using the human example. Now during inspiration, that's the breathing in process, and expiration, which is the breathing out process, air is pushed into and out of the lungs through a series of cavities, tubes, and openings by the action of certain muscles. The respiratory tract consists of various parts, as illustrated. These parts are the nostril, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, epiglottis, glottis, larynx, trachea, bronchus, lungs, diaphragm, pulmonary venule, pulmonary arteriole, alveolus, and the associated capillary network. Now, if we analyze the nose first, it consists of two nasal cavities with specialized ciliated cells in the narrow part of the nasal cavities acting as receptors. The nasal cavity opens into the upper portion of the pharynx, also known as the nasopharyngeal region, or nasopharynx, which is visible in these figures. As the air passes in along the air passage, it is filtered, warmed, and moistened. Now, filtering is accomplished by the coarse hair and cilia in the region of the nostrils and by the cilia alone at the rest of the nose and trachea. Air taken in by either the nose or the mouth enters the pharynx, which is known as the throat. In the pharynx, the air passage, that is the trachea, and the food passage, that's the esophagus, are temporarily joined. The trachea, which lies in front of the esophagus, is normally open, allowing the passage of air. The trachea closes only during swallowing with the help of the epiglottis, allowing the food to enter the esophagus only. The larynx, or voice box, lies on top of the trachea. At the top of the larynx is an opening called the glottis. A flap of tissue, which is known as the epiglottis, which helps direct the food and air into their respective tubes, i.e. the esophagus and trachea, is present on top of the glottis. The trachea is a tube held 
open by C-shaped cartilaginous rings. Cilia that project from the epithelium of the trachea keep the lungs clean by sweeping mucus and debris towards the throat. The trachea divides into two bronchi, each of which enters their each lung. The bronchi then branch into a large number of smaller passages called bronchioles. Now, each bronchiole then terminates into a multitude of air pockets or sacs called alveoli. And it is these alveoli that make up the large percentage of the lungs. This diagram of the air passages in the lungs gives you an idea of how complex a structure of, and a network of, that nature has created in a very artistic way and scientific manner. Dear students, you may also be surprised to know that there are approximately 300 million alveoli with a total cross-sectional area of 60 to 70 square meters in each lung. Each alveolar sac is made up of simple squamous epithelium cells surrounded by blood capillaries. Gaseous exchange occurs between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the capillaries, where oxygen diffuses in and joins with the hemoglobin molecule that carries it to various cells of the body for respiration, and carbon dioxide diffuses out and is exhaled through the same passage. Dear students, with this we've come to the end of our program. I wish to thank you once again for your attention. Until we meet again, wish you the very best. Khuda Hafiz.